If you would go ahead and be seated, please. I'd like to say as we get started today that it's a, it's a wonderful day to be with you. You've already been wished a happy new year, and, and I wish to give you that same wishing that you would have a, a happy new year. I have a verse I want to share with you, but before I do that, I just want to make a quick, somewhat cryptic announcement. Most of you know that Jackson and Emma will be coming and joining us. Their first week officially here will be Sunday the 22nd. We're going to have on that day a, a fellowship meal where we're going to be able to show them how much we appreciate them and so happy to have them with us. The ladies are planning some things specifically for that. You might see Darlene or Elaine uh, just to talk about some of the things that we have in place that we want to do for Jackson and Emma as they arrive. Uh, again, just to let them know how much we appreciate them. In Isaiah 43, in verse 19, Isaiah says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? He's speaking here the voice of God. And God is saying to the people in Isaiah's time, I'm doing a new thing. This is the first day of the new year, 2023. Firsts are interesting times. These first days every year. The day that we get together, we call New Year's Day. We, we celebrate the old year out and on the new day, it's it's like a new beginning. And I, I want to talk about that just a little bit. I mean, one of the things that, that we do on, on New Year's Day frequently is we will do what we call New Year's resolutions. Now, that's not a new concept. I don't know if you knew that or not, but New Year's re resolutions we didn't invent in 2023. They were actually invented some 4,000 years ago in Babylon where the people would get together on the new year and they would make special promises to their gods. They were a polytheistic society and they would make new promises to their gods every year on the first of the year with the hope that the gods would bless them. And if they failed to keep their promises, they knew the gods would not bless them. In fact, might actually do damage to them. I was very successful a few years ago in doing a New Year's resolution. And I, I've done a little looking around and some study, and, and what we see is about 40% of people today still do New Year's resolutions, and almost all of them will have broken their New Year's resolution by January 31st, or if not, they will break them sometime in February. So they rarely last. A few years ago, I was very successful in setting up a New Year's revolution, resolution, and I've been successful until this year, and that resolution was no more New Year's resolutions. And for a period of several years, I, I didn't make one. But some things happened to me this year that made it more difficult for me not to have some New Year's resolutions. Last January, I was contacted by the executive leadership of the company that I'm working for. And they invited me to participate in what they called a leadership development program. And I thought when I signed up for that, that that was going to be teaching me things about how our organization needed specific leaders and specific roles to do specific things. And it turned out to be as much as anything about business, about looking inside, about looking at who you were and, and whether or not you were happy with that person you found inside. They, they gave us tools and techniques to break down what it is that we enjoy doing and what it is we don't necessarily enjoy doing. What, what makes us happy? What makes us proud of the things that we do? And they had us write down in a journal every day. And every day was a different topic and every day was again, breaking yourself down one, one day at a time, trying to understand what it is it makes us be the way we are. And this morning, I'm not going to take you through that LDP program. I wouldn't have time. It took us a whole year to go through that process. But I am going to want us to think about that concept of who are you and who do you want to be. And considering today, 
to be the possibility of a new beginning for you in your life, in who you are, and perhaps taking the first step today to being the person that you want to be on January the 1st, 2024, as we go through this next 12 months. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about some stories from both the Old and the New Testament, where people had some new beginnings. And I don't want necessarily to read them out of the Bible. I want to tell you the story. So please forgive me if I don't go and, and read verse by verse by verse, but just kind of tell you the story. The first one is going to be about a man who was, who was afraid. He was fearful in his life at the time that we meet him. He's quite honestly a little bit snarky at times in the things that we'll hear him say in the very beginning of his story. And he's a man who's discouraged and he's blaming God for everything that goes on in his life. One day this man is hiding down in a wine press, which is kind of a, a low spot in the earth. where You couldn't see him from a distance. He's down in the wine press, but he's not pressing wine. He's threshing wheat manually. No animals involved. No stone to use that to break off the grains of the wheat. He's just kind of beating it himself and thrashing it out. Why would he be doing that? Well, he's afraid. He's afraid if he uses his animals and shows them he has harvested wheat that the Midianites are going to come, they're going to take his wheat away. Why is he afraid of that? Well, because the Midianites have taken over God's people. They've completely come in and they've taken control of all of the Jewish nation. And that's exactly what they're doing. They are stealing from them and leaving them barely enough food to survive. And this man is afraid if he does this work out in the open, that they'll take what little bit he has. He's a fearful man. And while he's down inside the wine press, thrashing out the wheat, the angel of the Lord comes and appears to him and says to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor, a man afraid, hiding in a pit, thrashing out his wheat, an angel comes and says, mighty man of valor. And the angel gets a snarky response. The man says to the angel, oh really? Where is God? Where has God been? Look at what's going on. I'm down here in the bottom of this pit threshing out the grain because the Midianites have destroyed the people. Now my dad has talked about and our fathers have talked about all of the great things that God has done. But where is God? Discouraged. Feeling like he had no hope. No place to go. Now in the text that you will find in the book of Judges in chapter 6, 7, 8. Things change right here. And it's interesting the way it changes because we've been talking about this man is talking to the angel of God. And the next verse says, And the Lord said to him, not the angel, but the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the big name of God. God now is speaking to him, perhaps directly through that angel, but it is God's voice that this man will hear. And he says to this man, go in your might, this might of yours, and save Israel from the hands of Midian. Do I not send you? Am I not sending you to go? This man has a very low self-esteem. And he says to God, Lord, my tribe is the smallest of the tribes. And within my tribe, my clan, my father's family is the lowest of the people of this lowest tribe. And of my father's sons, I am the least 
I am the least of the least of the least. Why would you come to me? And God says, I'll go with you. And when you fight the Midianites, you'll fight the army as though it's one man. And you will win because I'm with you. And Gideon, a name that you know if you haven't already figured out the story, Gideon gets up and he says, I I need some signs, God, that you're really you before I go to do this great thing. If you'll wait, will, will you wait just a moment and let me go get a present for you? And so God agrees. And he goes and he kills an animal and he cooks it and he cooks it with some some other vegetables and bring some unleavened bread and he brings it out to the angel. And the angel says, put it on that rock right there. So Gideon does. And the angel takes his staff that he was carrying in his hand and he touches the rock with the tip of the staff and fire, not from heaven, but fire comes up from inside the rock and burns up the food completely burns it up and the angel disappears. Gideon knows he's talked to God. Now Gideon needed a fresh start. He was a fearful, snarky, discouraged man. But the angel came and changed his day. You know the rest of the story. Gideon assembles an army. God says, "Ah, you got too many people. So he finds different ways to Take out the people who were there. He asked the scared ones to leave. Most of them did. Still too many people. Go have them drink water out of the creek. And the ones that do it one way, send them home. And the ones that stay, keep them. 300 men go to fight the entire Midian army. And Gideon's army defeats them in a rout. It's not a close battle. It's a rout. And Midian never is the same as they were before. And this man becomes one of the great judges of Israel. And he's in charge for 40 years. And for 40 years when Gideon is in charge, the people worship God. Not the Baals, they worship God. And they have peace. And when Gideon dies, Gideon, who was the smallest of the smallest of the small, has 70 sons. No longer the smallest of the small. A great man, a great judge of Israel. And someone we still talk about today. Gideon and Gideon's army. The next one is a lady. And as we talk about her, there were several ladies I could have chosen from, but this one was one that had a story that sounded like several others. This this woman had a husband. Her husband had another wife. And this woman didn't have any kids. Now, today that's not that big a deal. A, A woman in our society that chooses not to have a child or cannot have a child is just like any other woman in our society. But that wasn't true at the time for two reasons. Number one, in her place in that society of that time, her primary job as a wife was to give her husband a son who would carry on his name and would continue to do the work that her husband had begun. And this woman has no son. The second reason that having a son was important to a woman back in those times is they didn't have social security. They didn't have 401k. When a husband would die under any circumstance, the inheritance all went to his sons. There was no opportunity for the inheritance to go to the wife. It could only go to the sons. And if there were more than one son the oldest son would get a double portion of whatever that inheritance was. Why? Because he took care of his mama. See, men married women many times decades younger than they were, and the men almost always died first. And God had provided a way for the woman to be cared for. It was cared for 
by her oldest son. This woman has no son. But I told you the man had two wives. The other wife has sons and daughters. And she is picking on this woman because this woman is worthless and has no value. She is seen by her society as being less than the person she should be. This man's a religious man. He goes to the prophet every year and he offers sacrifices. And when he goes to offer sacrifices, on the day that he offers sacrifices, he gives a portion to the wife that has kids. And he gives a portion to every son. And he gives a portion to every daughter. And he comes to this other woman whom he loved best. And he gives her a double portion. But she can't eat. Her stomach's so upset. She's not doing what she should do for her husband. This other wife is just torturing her by teasing her and criticizing her and telling her that she's worthless to her husband. The husband says, am I not worth 10 sons to you? That's how much he loves her. She can't worship God. She can't eat. One year while they're there, she's outside the doorpost of the temple on her knees, on her hands. And the prophet comes out and he sees her there and he goes over to look at her and he can see her mouth moving. You're starting to figure out who I'm talking about. And Eli the great prophet says, why are you drunk here at the house of the Lord? Put your wine away. And Hannah looks up at him and says, Lord, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring my soul out to God. I'm asking God to remember me, his servant, and not forget me. The Bible doesn't tell us that Hannah told Eli what her prayer was, just that she was pouring her heart out to God. And Eli says, get up, be assured and go on your way. The Lord God of Israel will hear your request. That's all she needed. She gets up. She goes and eats food. Hannah needed a fresh start. Her life was in ruins and she needed a fresh start. So she finds herself on her knees praying to God so fervently that her lips are moved. By the time they're ready to go back, for the next visit, for the next time to go and worship God and offer sacrifices, Hannah's with child. Hannah refuses to go back. She bears a son. She talks to her husband and she tells him, not until the child is weaned will I go back to worship God. And the husband says, that's fine. So she weans the child. And the next time they go back to worship God, they bring some special sacrifices for the child. And she goes to Eli and she says, do you remember me? I'm the woman you found by the post. And you thought I was drunk and I was only praying. I want you to meet my son, Samuel. This is what I prayed for. And God has listened to my prayers. And part of my prayer was that if you will give me a son, I will give him to you for the rest of his life. And so I have brought my son here to the house of God, and you keep him, and you let him serve God all the rest of his life. And then she goes home. Hannah needed a second start, a fresh start. But you might say to me, Wayne, that doesn't sound like a very good story. Because she didn't have a child. She took the only child God gave her and, and now she's gone home. But every year when Elkanah, Elkanah and Hannah would go and worship God, Hannah would bring a coat for her son who wore the priestly garbs and worked and served all year long with Eli and the other sons of Eli. And every year 
they would talk to Eli and every year, the way I read it, every year Eli would pray a prayer. And I want to read that prayer to you very quickly. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2 verse 20. May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. I don't know how many years Elkanah and Hannah went to see Eli the prophet and Eli prayed that prayer. But I know God heard it. Because in 1 Samuel 2 verse 21, Indeed the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters and the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. She got a fresh start. She got a new life and she did the best she could with the life given to her. The last one that I will use as an example today is a young boy in the New Testament. I'm not going to start off with his name. But this young boy had a great beginning. Unlike Gideon, perhaps unlike Hannah, this, this young man had a great start. He actually was a disciple of Jesus. In fact, there's a section in one of the Gospels that will say, and a young man followed him. This is talking about the night that Jesus was taken out of the Garden of Eden, or out of the Garden of Gethsemane rather, and was being carried down into Jerusalem to be tried for his life. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth around his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. This young man knew Jesus, saw him. I'm jealous. I'm already jealous. He, he actually had a chance to hear Jesus speak while Jesus was on the earth. He was there in the garden when Jesus was taken. Now you might say, Wayne, he ran away. Yeah, he did. But he wasn't the only one, was he? In fact, there was none that stayed that night. When Jesus was taken away, everybody, disciple, apostle, everybody left Jesus at that point. But this young man also knew the Apostle Peter. If you go into Acts 12, beginning in verse 12, and I'm going to leave one word out of this. Peter has been in prison, and the angel comes and lets him out of prison. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of this man, whose other name was a different name. And there were many gathered together, and they were praying. So, when Peter was released from prison, when he wanted a place to go where he knew the church was, it was in this man's mother's home. In 1 Peter 5 verse 13, Peter's preach, talking about there, he's in the process of wrapping up his book, and he says that a person who is, he, he says, she who is at Babylon, she who is at Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does this boy, and Peter calls him my son. He's not actually Peter's child, but Peter looks at him as a child in the faith. So he knows Jesus, and he knows Peter. That's pretty good company to find yourself in, but he also knows Paul and Barnabas. And we know this from occasions that we find in Acts chapter 12, verse 25. This is not too long after this event with Peter Paul and Barnabas are about to leave on their very first missionary journey. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them this boy along with them. And they go on the journey. They get a part of the way through. And this young boy named Mark turns back. That's when the story changes. He had a good start. He had moved down the path. He was in contact with and in association with good people who could give him the things that he needed. And yet he's turned back and he's gone home. Later, Barnabas being Barnabas. Barnabas comes to Saul and he brings with him John Mark. And he says, we need to take John Mark with us. Now that's, that's Barnabas. If you can think about it for just a moment with me, Barnabas took another young man 
who had been converted in a very unusual way in the city of Damascus, who had come back to Jerusalem and tried to attach himself to the church, and nobody would take him. Nobody. Except Barnabas. Barnabas took Saul to Peter, and that was enough to get Saul brought into the church in Jerusalem. Things happen. People are trying to kill Paul. They send him home. Barnabas winds up in Antioch, which is one of the first places to send missionaries out to do the work of God. And Barnabas says, I know a man. We, we need to have this man if we're going to be successful in our mission work. And he goes and he brings Saul and he brings them to the elders in Antioch and they put their hands on Barnabas and Saul and this young man Mark and they send them off on that first journey. Now it's the second journey. Barnabas, being Barnabas, brings John Mark to Saul and says, we need to bring Saul. You'd think Paul could remember and would understand that Barnabas always tried to help people be better. Nope. They argue. They fight. They argue. They yell back and forth at each other. Saul does not want John Mark to come again. Maybe if we can be charitable, maybe Saul is, Paul is saying, look at how much he failed the first time. Look at how much that hurt him as a person to fall, to turn back. If he does it again, maybe he's gone forever. Or maybe Saul just said, I don't need somebody I can't trust. Probably the latter. Knowing Paul, maybe the latter. Barnabas said, I'm taking him. Paul said, you're not going with me. So Barnabas said, fine. I'll go myself. They split. They break up as a missionary team. And Paul goes back up into Asia. And church history tells us that Barnabas first goes to Cyprus and then ends up in Egypt where he does a lot of work with John Mark. Now I wish the Bible told me more about how Mark, who really needs right now a second chance, a new beginning, I wish I knew more about how that started. I don't know. There's not much more here. Except in 2 Timothy, when Paul is in prison in Rome, soon to be killed by Nero. He's writing and he says, when you come to Timothy, when you come, bring John Mark. Because John Mark is useful. He's a good servant of God. I need him for the work of ministry. And I want you to bring John Mark with you. Even Paul, later in life, recognizes the value of John Mark. And if you open your New Testament and you turn past that first gospel, what's the top on the page for the second gospel? What's the name there? Mark. A lot of scholars believe, and I tend to agree, that Mark was the first gospel written. And that the other writers of the Gospels used him as kind of a structure, at least Matthew and Luke, used Mark as a structure for how they would build their Gospel. Think about the influence that Mark has had in the mission work he did with Barnabas in Egypt. And in sitting down and writing one of four Gospels that people still read today to learn about Jesus. He took full advantage of his second beginning, his new beginning. Quickly, I need to apply our lesson today because we're running out of time. The first thing I want you to understand is God has a plan for you. I'm going to read Darlene's favorite verse. Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 11. God speaking says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. I know the plans I have for you. If God could speak to us directly today, he might say the very same thing 
to each one of us. Now, I don't know the plans God has for you. I don't know if you will be a great leader like Gideon was and lead his people to peace and a time of prosperity. I don't know. I don't know if God's plan for you is the influence you will have on your family in turning them to the Lord and them perhaps converting thousands. I don't know. Maybe you're going to be someone who through the work that you do yourself will have an everlasting influence in the life of one or millions through the work you do. I don't know. I don't think you know either. But I think each one of us today should recognize and understand that God has a plan for you. And all we need to do is to put ourselves in the path where God will lead us and direct us and take us to that plan that he has for us. Number two, and this may be necessary because that's kind of scary to think about us following God's plan, is God will be your strength while he is carrying you forward to find that plan. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 30. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. They will not faint. I want to encourage you to learn to wait for the Lord. Sometimes we get anxious. We feel like we have to move on our own timeline. Paul was among the worst that had to learn to wait for the Lord for the right time and for the right purpose. I struggle with patience. Maybe you do too. Sometimes we need to find the right time. We need to wait for the Lord to work in us and to take us to where he wants us to be. And we need to watch for those opportunities because he will give them to you. And when you see them, you have to be willing to walk with the Lord to accomplish those things that God gives you to do. One last verse from Psalms 121. And I said one last verse, one last psalm. We'll leave the whole thing. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heavens and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forever. What a beautiful psalm and what a beautiful song that we sometimes sing taken from that we're going to lift our eyes up to the hills and find our help I think as we're going on the path that God has built for us that he's got that plan for us we need to recognize that when I need help like Gideon needed help like Hannah needed help like John Mark needed help your help will come from God. He will be there to help you be successful. He will help you in ways to guard your life, even to the point of guarding when you go out and when you come back home. And he'll do this not for a little bit, but for the rest of your life. From now until forevermore, God will be your help. Today is a day for new beginnings. I don't know what you need 
in your life today. I don't know what your needs for a new beginning are, but all of us today have a chance for new beginnings. If you're not a Christian and you need to receive salvation, if you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, if you will repent from your sins and confess Jesus as God's Son and submit yourself to the action of baptism, the water's warm. You can have your new beginning today. Maybe, maybe you're more like Mark. Maybe you've struggled in your Christian walk. Maybe you're not doing the things that you know you need to be doing to be the Christian man or woman God has called you to be. Well, God's provided a way for you to get a new start. We can pray to Him for you on your behalf that He would release the sins from you and give you the ability and the power to move forward. And just like He did with Gideon, you can go and you can win your battles. Or maybe, maybe you're just weighed down with all the struggles and all of the difficulties and all the trials that come in our life, and you're just overwhelmed, and you don't even know what you need. Kind of like Hannah was. And you need prayers. You need someone to hear your prayers. If there is any way that we can help you this morning, to leave this building with a new beginning. Won't you come? While we stand, I encourage you to do so.
you all saw Becca come forward this morning and she kind of drug her sister along with her a little bit. They're, they're the latter of those three things that I talked about this morning. They're going through a struggle of life right now as we understand it and know. Becca said, I, I don't even know what to pray for anymore. She told me a little bit about what's going on with Joe and why Laura's not here this morning. That Joe's really going through a lot of struggle. He's had a lot of pain. He's, he's not sure he can keep going. And this morning, he, he didn't want Laura to leave. He just didn't want to be alone. He wanted her there during this time of difficulty for his life. And she's just asked that we pray for her to have her strength and to give her courage to go through what lies before them. And of course, we're gonna do that and we're gonna pray not only for them, but for the whole family because Joe is in a very difficult place right now as I think most of us know. And if you haven't been through this, when someone is hurting and sick, someone that you love and care for so deeply, it's often that you don't know what to pray for. You, you know what you feel, but you don't even know then, do I, do I want dad or mom to continue on the way they are? Do I want them to get better? Do, do I want them to just go home to God? It's, it's a hard place that a family faces and that family is facing that even this morning. So if you would bow with me, we will pray for Becca, for the family, for Joe, for Laura, as they're going through this difficult time. Please bow with me. Dearest Father, we know that through the greatest struggles and trials and difficulties of our life, when we are unable even to know what to say or to know what to pray or to know how to begin a prayer to you, that you already know the thoughts of our heart. And that at times, Father, we will come to you only with the groanings of our soul. And you tell us in Scripture that in times like that, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of each one of us knows what we need and knows what our hearts want to pray, and he prays for us to you so that you can hear us and give us those things you need. Father, we ask you to be with Becca, especially as she's come forward tonight expressing her concerns and her needs and the fact that she needs her church family to help her through this. Father, we ask you to be with that whole family, each one of them as they're struggling through this, as they're going through this difficult time in their life. We ask you, Father, to bless them, to give them a constant sense of your abiding presence, to let them know that you are their helper and that you're there, and that you'll be with them everywhere they go, and every hour of the day. And Father, we don't know what to pray for. Selfishly, we, we would want Joe to get better so that he could be with his family longer. We would, we would want him to be able to live a longer life and to extend his life as long as possible, Father, but we don't know if that's best for Joe or if that's only what we want selfishly. But Father, we know and we trust that you know what is best. And our prayer today, Father, is that you do what's best for Joe. And if it's best for Joe to stay, we know that you will give him a longer life. If it's best for Joe to come home, Father, we only ask for a quiet and peaceful time for him to make that transition. Father, help those of us who are the family here, those who are in involved with Joe, with Laura, with the children. Help us to give them our comfort. Help us to give them our support. This is a family that is a good family and they need that from us. So help us see the opportunity to reach out and grasp their hand. And Father, these things we ask through Jesus' holy name and amen.